larger community called humanity. So in biological terms, the organism that's evolving on the planet is not the human being. We already did that. The organism that's evolving is the superorganism called human civilization. And right now, humans are fighting each other and killing each other. And if I say, well, what would that look like inside the body if the cells fight each other and kill each other? And I say, oh, well, that's called autoimmune disease, self-destruction. Mm. And, and autoimmune disease can kill you from the inside. And that's on the increase, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, because, the, because our biological lives are complements to the environment. Yeah. The more stress and more violence on the outside, the more that's taken inside in biology and converted to uh, uh, disruption and disharmony of your own cellular internal community. So what can we then do as a human race? Maybe it's an obvious question, but here we are. We represent, in a way, the 50 trillion cells that are in our own bodies on a bigger scale. And here we are. We see the intelligent ones, the ones that are really looking and seeing what happens inside their own body. They're seeing what happens on the outside. But, as you mentioned again, in spontaneous evolution, there's also the consensus reality. Yes. And even though individual people can see what's happening, what can they actually do when there's this whole other, I suppose, stronger force playing its part? Well, you're right, Dan. I mean, it's a stronger force because everybody's mind is like a tuning fork because actually you can read brain activity from outside your head with a new thing called magnetoencephalograph. Most people are familiar with electroencephalograph, put wires on your head and read your brain function. Okay. Yeah. The new one, magnetoencephalograph, they put a probe out here and they can read your brain function from outside. Well, it's a very important point. He says, well, if you're reading my brain function from outside, then what am I doing? I must be broadcasting my brain function. So all of us are like tuning forks. But if we're all out of tune, then there's a tendency for even a tuning fork that tries to stay in tune will be pushed out of tune by something we call entrainment. And the issue is, how can you survive in this world? And the answer is you must essentially detach yourself from this field around you, not be taken in by the stories, not be buy into the fear, not to buy into the threats on our existence, to start to recognize, look, we are creating these lives. If you buy other people's creation, then you manifest what they're creating. If you want what you want, then you have to not get engaged. And the more conscious you become, the less you are affected by the outside fields. And so this rising consciousness that we're seeing is the evolution of humanity to rise above the noise of the background and recognize you are the creator, just like we talked about. If you can create a honeymoon for yourself while you're in love and everyone started to create a honeymoon for themselves, then all of a sudden the concept of war and violence would disappear because if everybody's in love and everybody's in harmony and everybody's so excited by being here, then the competition and violence that we live by because of today's beliefs would disappear. And the reality is we are moving in that direction right now. Day by day, more people are taking back the power of saying, I'm not buying your belief. You have to be consciously stand apart, don't you? And yes. Say, I'm not going to be part of this. Right. And it's interesting because a lot of people say, well, I'm going to go in there and fight that system. And I go, you know, that's not really good either because yeah. if you're fighting the system, then you're contributing energy, whether it's pro or con, to that system. The way to fight the system is not to be part of the system. Uh, uh, and it's fun because I, I talked to some British people I know, and they were, I forgot what they were called, but they were people who are somewhat living all through England, but nobody knows where they are, who they are, they're sort of out there, and they're having this life independent uh, uh, of, the, of the government even knowing who they are. Uh, and it's like some level, of, we all have to start doing that, but when we do that, then we'll find there's more of us than the other ones. And then all of us who are on the outside of the system actually become the new system. So it becomes this critical point where things start to shift, you feel? Yeah, and yeah. I think we're really approaching that with 2012. And I think that is a very auspicious beginning because it's, a, uh, it's not a mystical thing. It's, a, it's really a, a change in the energy fields of the Earth because the Earth is changing its position in relationship to the Milky Way. Uh, so basically, uh, the, the energy that comes from, from all the stars, uh, and the sun especially, influence who we are. When we change our positions uh, in the relationship to the field, we change our response because we evolved in the field of energy. And when the field of energy changes, so do we. Something else you talk about in the book, which I found quite fascinating, was the placebo effect and oh. the, the nocebo effect. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because a lot of people understand what the placebo effect is. And what is this? Well, 
It's interesting because uh, medical science has revealed that from one third to two thirds, which is significant, of all healing, whether it's drug related or surgery or whatever healing process, the healing didn't come about from the process. The healing came about because the person believed the process was going to heal them. So if I give you this brand new drug and it's purple colored because that makes it really special, you know, uh, and it's funny because there is a drug, a purple drug, and they said, it's purple. And everybody's <laughs> like, oh, wow, that's got to be special. But people believe that the drug holds this effect. And you give a person this drug, and all of a sudden they heal themselves, and they say, yeah, the drug did it. And then you tell them later, but it was just a sugar pill. Uh, that, that healing didn't come from the drug. It came from the belief in the drug. So the belief in healing so is what heals you. it comes back to the mind you. again, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it's again the power of belief. In this case, it's a very yeah. positive belief that this procedure, drug, or whatever is going to heal me. But what people haven't talked about, because everyone knows about the placebo effect, is that the placebo effect on a, is based on a positive thinking, what is the consequence of negative thinking? Ah, well, science has a term for it, but it hasn't really come out in the public. It's called the nocebo effect. And the nocebo effect has been revealed by science that a negative thought can not only make you ill, but a negative thought can also kill you. You can be scared to death in a, in a real sense, okay? Uh, and, and why is that important? Because it turns out it's not just the positive thought of a placebo that's influential. The negative thought works the same way with the same power but in the opposite direction. So basically it's not placebo, nocebo. It comes down simply this. It's the power of thought. And a positive thought will move you in a healing direction and a negative thought will move you into an illness direction. Uh, but before I get off that topic, I don't want people to go out there in the audience and go, oh, 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 one of those positive thinking kind of guys. And it's like, it's more than just positive thinking. It's a, a commitment and an intention of positive thinking. It also really needs the support of your subconscious belief. Because if your subconscious belief is going, oh, that new age weirdo stuff, if that's what your subconscious is programmed to believe, and yet your conscious mind is the one that says, I will think positive thoughts, and I go back to the data. Only 5% of your life is coming from the conscious mind. So if you're only entertaining a positive thought with your conscious mind, you're only contributing 5% of that to your life. 95% of your life is still coming from the subconscious. And if the subconscious doesn't hold those beliefs, then you're actually fighting yourself and not likely to realize the expression of a positive thought. So let's look at this again practically. So someone's not feeling well, they've got, I don't know, they've got the flu or yes. they've got something wrong with their stomach or something. What should they practically do? They should presumably go to the doctor and get a diagnosis. Would you go along with that? I'm just, I'm just trying to see I, I, where I, this yeah. goes in day-to-day -day life. Well, I wouldn't say don't go to a doctor, but I say before you go to a doctor, just look around and think about this. What's going on in your life? Where are the stresses coming from? Because it's almost uh, uh, your physiological expression is a complement to your life experiences. Those people that are happy are healthy. As I said, when you're in the honeymoon, you didn't get sick in the honeymoon. That's when you're absolutely healthy. But when you got caught back up in the real life, that's when illnesses start to occur. So we always look at, oh, I must be sick. There must be something wrong with my biology when it turns out. It didn't begin with your biology. Only about 2% of illness is actually connected to genetics, let's say. 98% mm -hmm. of illness is not just genetics, it's environment. So when a person says, oh, I have the breast cancer gene, and people think, oh, I'm going to get breast cancer, and I say, well, wait, wait. 50% of women that have the breast cancer gene get cancer. What about the 50% that have the gene and didn't get the cancer? And we never study that side. We only study the side that got the cancer, and you find out, well, what is it that the 50% do that don't have the cancer yet have the gene? What's different? The answer is their lifestyle is different. Their f stresses, their fears, their concerns are, are not the same as the one that get the illness. It, the genes are, are like give you a propensity to get a disease, but that propensity is based on how you perceive life. Uh, and it's interesting. Uh, studies show that when children get adopted into a cancer family, yeah. the adopted child will get the cancer with the same percentage or probability as any of the natural sibling. And you say, but yeah, but the, the child came from totally different genetic stock. And the point is, yes, it wasn't the genes that promoted the cancer, it was the lifestyle that promoted the cancer, especially the lifestyle of stress. And then I say, well, if stress is causing lifestyle, and I look around at the world and I go, 
my God, no wonder everybody's sick. Every day is filled with more stress than the day before. And if you buy into the stress, you take that disharmonious vibration, essentially, bring it in your life, and you end up with disharmony inside your body. Your life is a reflection of what you see. Yeah, it's a question of going back a few steps. That's what I'm hearing. And just, yes. And just looking to see, well, I'm not feeling well, and I had the same thing last year. What's called, what's behind that? Am I happy in my life? What is emotionally happening? Absolutely. What is happening physically? Am I doing the right things to support my body? Absolutely. It's a fundamental it's very, look, yeah. isn't it? I, I don't want to say don't go to the doctor, so I, I'll go back just 20 years ago, the last time I went to a doctor. Okay. I went to a doctor because I had pneumonia. And I said to myself, well, you know, I, I can see why at that moment in my life there was so much stress going on in my life that I could see I, was, I had opened my system up to that. But then I also realized, okay, well, I can, you know, handle this with my consciousness. But then I realized the bacteria were doubling and they're growing faster than I can handle my consciousness. So I said, okay, now's the time for some penicillin. But the concept of it was... I don't rely on the penicillin, and, I, and all I had to say was, look, I get back on my feet and I go, it was my responsibility. And if I don't get into that same stressful situation again, then I won't have to go through this again. And it's been 20 years. So it's intelligent learning, isn't yes. it? Yes. Don't, don't discard the element of medicine until your yeah. consciousness gets high. And, and the fact is, when people have lower consciousness, because they're not strong enough in their consciousness to really manifest everything they want. They really need to take care of themselves more, eat better, better nutrition, do more exercises, do these things to add to your health. But the surprising thing is, if you get more and more and more conscious, there's a point where you get so conscious, then you become like a, a, the, the, the person we refer to as Jesus, who does all these miracles. And, well, and what, did, what, what did Jesus say about the miracles? He said, you could do these better than I could do them, but you don't believe. And that is the absolute truth. Because when you fully have control of your consciousness,